following sermon was delivered at the 1030 worship service at the United Methodist Church of Kent. Please enjoy. In today's first reading, the Apostle Paul wades into a dispute that has emerged apparently in the life and the experience of the early church in Corinth. In Corinth, a richly diverse and multicultural city, there were all sorts of temples dedicated to the worship of, of different gods. And in many of them, meat was offered on an altar as a ritual sacrifice, an act of worship and devotion to that specific god. Typically, this meat was a whole animal, and after the sacrifice was made, that whole animal would be cut up and then sold in the marketplaces out around town. Among the Christians in Corinth, there was a difference of opinion about what to do with this meat, this meat that had been given previously to idols. For some of them, it was just meat and should be eaten like any other meat. But for others, they were a little superstitious and uncomfortable about all of this, and so they chose to abstain from eating the meat. Now the question, very practically, comes to Paul. Which of these responses is the right one? We worship the God made incarnate in Jesus Christ. We're trying to live in Christ's way. As such, should we eat this meat that has been sacrificed to other gods or not? Well, in response, Paul begins by offering a string of affirmations that can sound ra rather like easy, maybe even dismissive slogans. We know that we all have knowledge, he says, and, and we know that a false god is not anything. And we know that there is no god except for the one god. These other gods don't even exist, Paul seems to be saying initially, so who cares if this meat has been dedicated to some non-existent thing? But then, mixed in with these short affirmations, after seeming to wave off the Corinthians' concern, Paul digs in a little deeper, beneath that surface question about meat dedicated to other gods, and he arrives at this more pressing and enduring question about how we ought to relate with one another across our many differences. Differences of opinion and practice and understanding. And then perhaps even more deeply into the relationship between our personal freedoms and the responsibilities that we have for our neighborhood. You know, most of us, of course, I assume at least, won't be faced with that specific surface level question today about whether to eat meat sacrificed to idols. Yet undoubtedly, those deeper questions remain for us, with us as persistent and perennial concerns. Which should we prioritize, our individual rights or our communal responsibilities? We're faced with that question all the time. How do we navigate those instances when these two things, our individual rights and our communal responsibilities, collide? We live in a culture deeply proud of our ideas about freedom, though we tend to talk about freedom in very narrow ways. Usually we talk about our personal freedom and our individual rights. Consider the content of so many of our political conversations these days on both sides of the partisan aisle. We talk about issues that way. What's in it for me or for people I consider to be like me? What will extend my ability to act and to say as I choose? We define freedom as being unrestricted, unencumbered, able to say and to do however we choose. I remember a few years ago during the height of the pandemic, during those mask mandates and then our struggle to distribute vaccines equitably, I remember a study showing the public health effects of our deep-seated control aversion here in the United States, that we value our ideas about personal freedom so highly that even the mere suggestion of someone telling us what we should do makes us not want to do it. Think of teenagers rejecting their parents' advice. Even if it's something that's good for us, even if we'd be quite willing to do the thing if left to our own devices, yet simply being asked or told to do a thing makes that thing feel to us like a burden, an intolerable infringement upon our personal freedoms. What I do and what I say is my right, we claim, and we cling to that idea as though it is an absolute, unimpeachable good. Well, not so, according to the Apostle Paul, and not so, according to our broader faith tradition. Yes, you have the right, the freedom, to go ahead and eat whatever meat you choose, Paul writes to the Christ followers in Corinth, but then he continues, watch out, he says, watch out, or else this freedom of yours might be a problem 
for your neighbors. And that's a problem. For by your actions, your insistence on asserting your rights, Paul says, no matter the cost to yourself or to others, you will separate yourself from Christ by choosing your freedom, by choosing your freedom over loving your neighbors. Paul takes this initial specific question about whether to eat certain meat, and he opens that question, he reframes that question into a more universal ethical question about the relationship between our individual rights and our communal responsibilities. And that more universal question then becomes the one that Paul addresses, both here in 1 Corinthians 8 and elsewhere as well. In Galatians 5, for example, Paul writes there, You were called to freedom, siblings, only do not let this freedom be an opportunity to indulge your selfish impulses, but instead serve each other through love. Paul's concern is that with folks new understanding about God's grace, new understanding that God's grace is given freely out of love, not earned through our right behaviors, they are now privatizing that newfound freedom, prioritizing that freedom over the well-being of the community. They are choosing, in other words, individual rights over communal responsibilities. I have the freedom to do anything, Paul writes earlier in this same 1 Corinthians chapter 6, but not everything is helpful. Just because I can do as I choose doesn't mean that I should. Just because I have the right to something doesn't mean that I need to have it. Our freedom can be a double-edged sword, and so that sword must be wielded carefully, not toward indulging ourselves, but instead toward the well-being of the whole neighborhood. Knowledge makes people arrogant, Paul writes at the beginning of today's lesson. But love, on the other hand, not just knowing that we are loved, but actually choosing to live that love, builds people up. Another translation says that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And it's that work, that work of building up the community, not puffing up ourselves, but building up others around us that must always be our primary focus and our concern. Love, love of God and love of neighbor, always is the higher good. Higher even than our personal freedom to do and to say as we choose. And so when those two collide, as they sometimes will, by grace we are called to choose love. That's the new authority by which Jesus speaks and acts and lives in today's gospel and always. Love, the, the ethic of neighborly love, love that liberates folks, that sets folks free even on the Sabbath, even when doing so violates the established rules. Such healing, such liberation, such wholeness, building folks up, caring for our community, such love before knowledge, before personal freedom is the way. A little later in 1 Corinthians, you'll recall that Paul offers that familiar hymn about love in chapter 13. If I have all gifts, skills, and abilities, he says, but I don't have love. I'm just a clanging gong or a clashing cymbal. If I have absolute freedom and access to everything that I desire, but I don't have love, I am nothing. If I do very generous and helpful things even, but I do not do them for the good of my neighbor, but instead to feel good about what I've accomplished, then I receive no benefit whatsoever. And then Paul goes on in that chapter to give us that litany of love's characteristics, and they are all, all about building up others, not puffing up ourselves. Love is patient, he says. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love does not brag. It isn't arrogant, isn't rude, doesn't seek its own advantage, isn't irritable, doesn't keep a record of complaints. Love isn't happy with injustice, but is happy with the truth. Love puts up with all things, trusts in all things, hopes for all things, endures all things. Love, not knowledge, not freedom, love never fails. That is our real freedom, the freedom of God's love. Because of God's love enacted for us and toward us, we are then freed from trying to earn our belovedness or prove our worth or accomplish our belonging. We have those things already. We are loved. We are worthy. We do belong. And so now, because of that, we're freed. But we're not freed for freedom's sake. 
We are freed so that we can love freely beyond our personal interests. We are freed so that we can love freely across our differences of opinion and practice and understanding, not puffing up ourselves, but building up the neighborhood. We are freed. We are freed so that we can love our neighbors more completely. Always ahead of my personal freedom is my responsibility to love my neighbor. That's the surprising twist in Paul's response to the Corinthians today. He knows well that the meat in question, it hasn't been changed in any way. The idols are nothing, so there can be no power attached to those idols or the meat just because it's been offered to them. But even knowing that, he refuses. He refuses to dismiss the concerns of those who understand differently than he does. Instead, he affirms their dignity, even saying that he won't eat meat ever again if doing so might harm his neighbor. It's such a different way of thinking than our more typical mindset. Our whole society has been built on this so-called dream that I should have the freedom to get what I want, to have whatever I can get my hands on. According to that mindset, Paul should respond to this question from the Corinthians by saying to them, go ahead. You know that idols aren't gods, so do what you want. Eat the meat. Don't let those overly sensitive folks get in your way. Don't let them infringe on your freedom. But instead, Paul says that we, in fact, have an obligation to restrict our freedom according to others' needs. And the consequences of that change in mindset are far, far reaching for our response to the current climate crisis, for our cultural addiction to guns, for our politics, for our health care, for our criminal justice system, for our conversations, our engagement with our community, for the food we eat, the cars we drive, the clothes we wear, the decisions we make daily about the use of resources in our control. Imagine all those choices made through this different lens, not simply made based in what I want, but with compassionate consideration for the impact of my choices on my neighbors. All the way back at the beginning of our scriptures, there's this story, it's a hard story, so we don't visit it often, about the very first set of siblings. They are kin, and yet you might recall they are at odds with each other because of their differences. One of the siblings asks this question that gets to the core of Paul's response to the Corinthians and a question that remains before each of us always. The question is, am I my sibling's guardian or keeper? Well, for those with the courage and the compassion to live Christ's way in the world, the answer to that enduring question must always and only be yes. Yes. For by God's grace, we have been given to each other. And for that, thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you for listening to this edition of the United Methodist Church of Kent Sermon Podcast. For more information about the church, visit www.kentmethodist.org.